Welcome to the OrthoClips podcast series where we're going to discuss the latest hot topics and high impact papers in orthopedic surgery. I'm your host, Saqib Rahman. Let's get this episode started. All right, we're up to episode five of season six. Today, we're going to talk about a publication in the JBJS, uh, September 18th, 2024. Uh, This is entitled, Integrated Dual Lag Screws Have Higher Reoperation Rates for Fixation Failure Than Single Lag Component Cephalomedullary Nails, Retrospective Study of 2,130 Patients with Intertrochanteric Femoral Fractures. The uh, lead author is Christian Gonzalez and the Hip Fracture Nail Study Group. Uh, There is funding provided in part by the AO Foundation, noted on the um, manuscript disclosures. So uh, this is a big study. It's worth discussing. Interestingly, there has been data suggesting, a little, somewhat mixed perhaps, but a lot of data suggesting that dual lag screws, uh, and we're talking about designs like the Smith & Nephew Intertan, that dual lag screws have more stability than a single lag screw for fixation of intertrochanteric femur fractures. Look, these are common injuries. They're being fixed all over the world in high numbers and with an aging population. This is is an important topic. Um, How can we best treat these? Do the dual lag screws provide better stability? There's a lot of feeling that Uh, this type of design helps to prevent rotational instability. You know, if you get perfect center center on both views with a single lag screw and you get get great compression, personally, I don't think that there's a ton of rotation that lends itself to a, a stability problem. If you're off, however, then what can happen is, meaning like if you're off with your screw, let's say you're center on the AP, but you're kind of posterior on the lateral, right? And you and you do have a little bit of rotational instability. Well, what can happen is that screw, you know, the, the fragment can rotate a little bit until the screw ends up a little bit more in a superior position, right? It goes from posterior to superior. And that's something that can happen. Well, nevertheless, let's get into the paper. So uh, this is a retrospective study. They compare the reoperation rates for fixation failure and kind of all cause reoperation between integrated dual lag screws and single lag screw cephalomedullary nails. And they compared the intertan with Synthes TFNA and Stryker Gamma 3. So, somewhat modern nails, at least in 2024, that we're using. And contrary to biomechanical studies and some prior meta analyses, this study found that the Integrated uh, d- you know, dual screws with the nail design were associated with a higher reoperation rate. So again, 2,130 patients, 13 level one trauma centers, and it's not exactly 50-50. 287 patients, which about 13%, got the dual lag screw, and 1,800 patients, or 86%, uh, got the um, single lag screw design. So reoperation for fixation failure was 4.2% in patients with the dual lag screws compared to 0.9% in the single lag screws. So almost four times difference. All cause reoperation rates were also higher for the dual lag screws, 7.3 versus 4.2%. Uh, now, there were some differences in the study groups. The dual lag screw group was a little bit of a younger population. They also had higher energy injuries and the resultant reductions were a little bit more varus. So um, you do have to keep that in mind. However, when they controlled for age, gender, injury mechanism, fracture pattern, post-operative neck shaft angle, uh, they still saw a higher odds risk for reoperation with the dual lag screws, about 1.83 times higher than with um, single lag screws, and overall 4.95 times higher rate of reoperation for fixation failure than single lag screws. So the majority of reoperations in general were due to fixation failure in the dual lag screw group. Well, it was kind of a minority of of reoperations in the single lag screw. So some limitations, it's retrospective, uh, right? So this is not a uh, prospective randomized trial, a lot of biases potentially. 
Uh, this potential for confounding by indication, you know, perhaps by patient age. Seems like the younger patients got the dual lag screw for the most part. Uh, there's a lack of data on surgeon-specific factors. Um, and honestly, we're still talking about relatively low numbers of reoperations for fixation failure. So you have sort of a wider confidence interval in the regression analysis. But the study does challenge the perceived superiority of the dual lag screw designs from the biomechanical and some clinical data from previously. So uh, they say you should have some caution when using the dual lag screw design for higher risk patients. And they sort of say you should probably consider single lag screw design for most fractures to minimize reoperations. But of course, you know, this is a retrospective design. There's a lot of study flaws. Perhaps more um, investigations are needed. So those are my thoughts. What do you guys think? You guys did a deeper dive into the study. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. So let's jump right in. Um, I'm actually pretty excited about this one, something that I've been uh, thinking about a lot recently. And uh, it's this new multi-center study on intertrochanteric fracture fixation. And it's honestly got me kind of like second guessing some of my go-to moves in the OR. Oh yeah, for sure. This paper from the September 18th, 2024 JVJS, and it's mouthful, integrated dual lag screws have higher reoperation rates for fixation failure than single lag component cephalomedullary nails just that title alone. Right. It's a retrospective study of over 2,130 patients with intertrochanteric femoral fractures. Yeah, and I mean, over 2,130 patients across 13 level IF fornis centers. Yeah. That's a that's a big study. You can't ignore that data. I mean, we've all heard of the like, you know, biomechanical arguments for IDLs, better stability, less cure cut out. Mm. But this study's findings are raising some serious questions. Yeah, it definitely challenges the status quo for sure. Yeah, so let's break it down, I guess. First off, why even do this study? I mean, we've been using both IDLs and SLs for years. Mm -hmm. What was the knowledge gap that they were trying to address? Yeah, so I think you hit the nail on the head when you said we've been using these for years. And that's kind of the problem. There's not a lot of great data out there. Right. Um, and so intertrochanteric fractures, they're incredibly common, over 7 million worldwide annually. Wow. And then when these things fail and you have to go back and reoperate fixation failure, it's a huge burden on patients, and it's obviously a huge cost to the healthcare system. So I think that's the main reason they did it. There just wasn't good data out there, and they wanted to sort of settle this debate once and for all. Absolutely. Yeah. We're always striving to improve outcomes and minimize complications for our patients. So, okay, so they set out on this huge study to hopefully give us some more definitive evidence. Now, while cephalomedullary nails are kind of the gold standard for these fractures, the choice between IDLs and SLs has always been a bit of a gray area. I mean, even for me, I feel like I'm going back and forth. Some days I'm like, ah, I use an IDL, and then some days I'm like, no, I'm going to use an SL. What did previous studies show? Was there any sort of consensus one way or the other? Yeah, so it's interesting. The previous data is really mixed. You have some studies that favor IDLs, some that show no difference. Um, and really, that was the impetus for this study. They actually hypothesized that there would be no clinically significant difference in reoperation rates between the two nail types. Oh, interesting. So going in, they were expecting it to be a wash. So they weren't expecting to find what they found. Exactly. Interesting. Okay, so let's take a step back even further and look at the data landscape before this study. So prior to this, what was the general consensus, if any, about IDLs versus SLs based on those previous studies? Biomechanically speaking, IDLs have often looked like the winner. The lab, the benchtop studies have shown that they have better load tolerance, greater resistance to screw cutout, less migration of the lag screw. So on paper, they seem to offer greater stability. So in the lab, IDLs look really good. Yeah. So then why are we even having this conversation? Why did they even do the study? Yeah, that's that's the million dollar question. Because when you look at the meta-analyses of actual patient outcomes, it's a little bit cloudier. And while some analyses did show a lower reoperation risk with IDLs, others found no significant difference. That disconnect between the lab and the real world is always so interesting. It is. So why do you think we see that discrepancy? So, you know, I think a lot of the earlier studies were limited by small sample sizes. They were single center designs. They were using older generation nails. And that's really what this JBJS study aimed to address. So they had a large multi-center cohort, and they really focused on the newer generation implants. So they wanted to make sure they're comparing apples to apples. Exactly. And really get a good, robust look. Yep. Okay, so let's dig into the study design itself. Um, how, do they, how do they set this whole thing up? So they did a retrospective cohort study, and they used data from 13-level eye trauma centers, 
And this covered a period from January 2014 to May 2021, and they included adults with intertrochanteric fractures. They were classified as AOTA 31A1 to 31A3. And these were treated with either the Trigen Intertan Nail for the IDL group, or the TFN Advanced or Gamma 3 Nail for the SL group. So they make sure to compare the same fracture pattern exactly. and nail generation so easy. that they weren't getting any confusing data. Precisely. All right, so it sounds like they set it up pretty well. Yeah, and then they excluded patients with less than three months of follow-up. Patients that had pathologic fractures and a few other specific criteria mm -hmm. just to kind of make sure they had a nice clean data set. And, you know, in the end, they had a massive sample size of 2,130 patients. That's a ton of patients. Now, when it comes to the patient demographics, were there any notable differences between the IDL and SL groups that jumped out at you when you were reading this? Yeah, there are a few things that I think are worth noting. Firstly, the IDL group was considerably smaller. They only had 287 patients compared to 1,843 in the SL group. And on average, the patients in the IDL group were younger. They had more high energy mechanisms of injury and more virus reductions post-operatively. Interesting. So more varus reductions. You know, for our listeners out there who might not be as familiar with varus alignment, could you quickly just touch on what that is and why it might be relevant here? Yeah. So varus alignment, for those who might not be as familiar, refers to a deformity where the distal segment of the bone is angled inward towards the midline. Fair. And the fact that the ideal group had more varus reductions is interesting because it suggests that they might have had more complex fractures to begin with, okay. which could potentially influence the risk of complications. Good point. So those are all things to think about when we're interpreting the results. Hmm. But let's get to the meat here. What were the key outcomes that they measured and what did they actually find? All right. So their primary outcome was the rate of reoperation specifically for fixation failure. They also looked at the overall all-cause reoperation rate as a secondary outcome. And this is where things get really interesting and perhaps a little bit unsettling. Out of the total 2,130 patients, 29 needed to go back to the OR for fixation failure. So that represents just 1.4% of the whole group. And 99 patients, or 4.6%, had to go back to the OR for any reason. But here's where things get interesting. The IDL group had a fixation failure reoperation rate of 4.2%, and that was significantly higher than the 0.9% in the SL group. Wow. That is a big difference. It is. Certainly not what I would expect given the, you know, all the biomechanical advantages that we talked about with IDL. Right. And it wasn't just limited to fixation failure. The IDL group also had higher odds of any reoperation. So 7.3% compared to 4.2% for SL. And both of those findings were statistically significant. All right. So this is starting to make me question everything I thought I knew about these nails. How did the authors explain these findings? Because this seems to go against some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier where some studies showed IDLs in a better light. What was their take on it? Yeah, so they had a couple thoughts. First and foremost, this is a huge study. Right. Over 2,130 patients from 13 different trauma centers. So I think the size and scope of this study makes it far more powerful and representative than a lot of the research that's out there. You know, huh. larger sample size is going to give you a more accurate picture of what's going on. That makes sense. What other factors did they talk about? This study also focused specifically on newer generation nails. So, you know, they were looking at the TFN Advanced, which has got the, those features intended to really improve stability and reduce cutout. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that these newer implants behave differently than some of the older generation nails that they were using in the past, and that could be affecting the results. Okay, so maybe those improvements to the design are actually changing things. Yeah, and then here's another crucial point that they made. There's no clear biomechanical explanation for why IDLs would have higher reoperation rates in this study. So that's another thing to think about. More research needed? More research is definitely needed. Got to figure out what's going on there. Yeah. All right. So for our listeners out there, the surgeons who are grappling with these decisions every day, what are the practical takeaways from this study? How should this change our approach to these intertrochanteric fractures. Yeah, I think the main takeaway is that we need to be more cautious with IDLs, especially in these high-risk patients. Mm -hmm. You know, these reoperation rates, especially for fixation failure, they're concerning. They can't be ignored. Especially when you have to go back and revise those. It's not a simple surgery. No, not at all. So I think based on this data, SL cephalomedullary nails appear to be the safer and more reliable option for most intertrochanteric fractures at least the ones that we're dealing with here with these newer generation implants. So does that mean we should never use an IDL? I don't think so. I think this study is important, but it's not the final word on this. 
You know, it definitely challenges our assumptions. It forces us to reevaluate our decision making process. But I think we can't just rely on biomechanical data or the theoretical advantages. We have to take into account what's actually happening in our patients. What's actually happening in the real world, exactly. not just in the lab. Right. Now, this study really focused on reoperation rates. What about the functional outcomes, the patient reported outcomes? Do IDLs still offer any advantages in terms of pain, mobility, quality of life? Or are SLs just as good in those regards? That's a great question. Unfortunately, this particular study didn't give us those answers. So that's definitely an area where we need more research. You know, it's possible that even though you're having higher reoperation rates, maybe the IDLs do give you some functional benefits. So I think we need more data to tease that out. So it sounds like we need way more research. Oh, yeah, for sure. But this is definitely a good jumping off point. Makes us think about it a little bit differently. Yeah. And like you said, the study focused on reoperations. But what about the long game? What about function? You know, do patients who get an IDL actually have less pain? Do they get their mobility back quicker? Are they able to get back to the things that they love doing faster? I think those are all questions that need to be answered. Yeah, and you know, maybe there are certain types of patients that actually do better with IDLs despite the higher reoperation risk. Yeah. So you think about younger patients, high demand patients, patients with more complex fractures. Maybe those are the patients where you might lean towards an IDL. Or maybe there are certain ways of putting these things in that can reduce the risk of failure. I think there's a lot more to explore. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe much more research to be done. Yeah. But at least this gives us a starting point. For sure. Makes us think about things a little bit differently. It's a good reminder that we can't just get stuck in our ways. You know, what we learned in residency or fellowship 10 years ago might not be trying today. Yeah, times are changing. Exactly. Always got to stay up on the literature. Well, I think we've thoroughly dissected this study hopefully given our listeners a lot to think about. A lot to chew on. I really appreciate you taking the time to go through this paper with me. It's been a pleasure. It's been a great discussion. Absolutely. To all of our listeners out there, thanks for tuning in to The Deep Dive. We'll see you next time.